Okay. All right. Well, Katie says we're ready to start, so start we will. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, where our topic today is how trees really work. Uh, my name is Neil Letson. I'm a member of the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council and will be your host for today's webinar. Assisting me is Katie Donaldson, who is a communication specialist at the University of Tennessee. Good morning, Katie. Good morning. Katie is the one who handles all the webinar pre-registrations, our promotions and notifications. She takes care of the behind the scenes technical duties and she processes your ISA CEUs after the webinar. So in other words, Katie is the one that really keeps this webinar series afloat and I really appreciate all she does. For our first time viewers, today's webinar is part of a monthly series brought to you through a partnership between the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council and the University of Tennessee School of Natural Resources. Our sole purpose is to offer you a variety of topics that we think will deepen your understanding of the importance of trees while inspiring all of us to grow healthier urban forest in the places where we live. And if you have any suggestions on topics and speakers for future webinars, please let us know. Now, as our audience has grown throughout the months, which we're very happy about, uh, we have people that are throughout the U.S. and even other countries. And speaking of this, we'd love to know more about where you're located. So please feel free to tell us where you are by using our chat room. And I know other folks will be interested in seeing that as well. So before we begin, I'm going to turn it over to Katie once more to cover some housekeeping items. All right. Good morning, everyone. So if you have not registered, please take a moment to register now for this webinar and please make sure that you enter all your information and also if you would put your name and your CEU certification number in the chat. This is how I check and make sure um, I have all the information for the participants to send for the CEUs. So please take a moment to do that. And at the end of the presentation, there will be time for you to ask questions and please put those in the chat and we will answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, Neil, is there anything I've left out? I think that does it. Uh, so with that, we'll introduce our speaker for today is Dr. Jennifer Franklin. Uh, Jennifer is a professor of forest restoration with the School of Natural Resources at the University of Tennessee. And she teaches a course in tree physiology uh, at the uh, school. Dr. Franklin is coming to us. I didn't ask you, uh, Jennifer, but you, I'm saying, I'm assuming you're coming to us from Knoxville, Tennessee. Yeah. And good. And I just want to thank you personally for being our speaker today. And anything you want to add, uh, please do. That's great. Thank you. I appreciate the invitation to be here. All right. And Jennifer, let me know if you have any issues sharing your screen. Yeah, put my. Okay, that looks good. Look good. All right. Good. Well, thank you very much for um, putting this together to the hosts and for inviting me and for quite a diverse audience, it looks like. Um, I've been looking at where everybody's from and there's uh, people from across the US, which is great. So I teach a couple of courses here to our forestry students. Um, one is uh, aimed at second year students and the other is for more for graduate students. So this is kind of a quick 45 minute summary of one whole course. Uh, so there's a lot that's left out, but I'm gonna just try to touch on this, some parts of how trees work and the internal workings of them. So
I'm not getting, okay, here we go. So when we look at a tree, you look at a tree and you really don't see much going on. And you know, we it, it's hard for us to see what the tree is actually doing or if it's doing anything. Um, and I know a lot of my younger students just see it as a big green thing. Um, for one, we can't see half of it, half of it's below ground. And for the other, it's really operating on a different, in a very different way from us. And I'm kind of reminded of a, a episode of Star Trek I saw once where the Star Trek, the Enterprise was visited by aliens and aliens lived on a very different um, time scale. So that one of their years was a minute of human time. And so they studied the, the crew of the Enterprise for a year and they concluded that, well, these you know, beings seem to have some signs of life. They really didn't move very much and so they probably weren't sentient. So it's just a matter of perspective. So we're gonna take, kind of take a look at the tree in a little bit different perspective and take a look at a seedling. And we're gonna use a couple of tools here. One is I'm gonna show you below ground so that we can look at the root system. Because remember that's half of the tree and we don't see it, uh, but a very important half. And the other is to look more at some of the internal structures. So, so a lot of this is very basic, just, just to get everybody uh, as a reminder and up to speed. We've got the leaves taking in CO2. So these are the stomata. So the leaf has these very small openings all over it called stomata and the CO2 goes in through the stomata. Now the leaves are able to open and close those stomata depending on the environmental conditions. So it can regulate how much CO2 is going into the, the leaf. Then the roots are taking up water. And if we look at the root system, roots of different species are very different. So they have different abilities to take up water and they're also associated with different microorganisms. So we have some that have um, ectomycorrhizae, others are associated with endomycorrhizae or vamp, vesicular or vascular mycorrhizae. And those help very much with the uptake of water as well as nutrients. So we have all these associations. And that I'm not gonna go more into that, but just be aware that they're there and they're very important to the tree. So if we look at where the roots are actually taking up water, the, the top four inches of soil are the richest in nutrients. And that's where you find most of the roots and you'll find most of the mycorrhizae and the nutrient uptake. The deeper layers of soil stay moist, and but they don't have as many nutrients. But a lot of this, the deep layers are where the roots are taking up water. And so you'll get this big proliferation of roots right above the water table, where there's still some aeration, um, but there's good water availability. So you get these kind of two different layers, the upper layer of roots and that deeper layer of roots. But that can poor aeration down below the water table restricts the growth of roots down into those very deep layers and you know, below the water table. So a lot of species are able to continue to take up uh, water when it's very dry. So if we look at the distribution of roots um, around the tree, this is a, a neat study that looked at where the roots are actually located. And you can see they're not evenly distributed at all. In this case, it was an irrigated tree. And the roots tended to proliferate around those irrigation uh, areas. You also have, you can see the spread of the crown and the roots go much further out than the edge of the crown. 
you can see in the photo of this, uh, an uprooted tree, how the center of that root system is all more coarse roots. All the fine roots are out towards the very edge of the tree. And so it's those fine roots that are really taking up the nutrients and also taking up water from the surface layers. So you get a lot of active roots in those uh, around the periphery of the root system, which can be quite far out from the, the trunk of the tree. So the water and solutes, which are nutrients, are entering the root mainly through the root hairs. So the root hairs are very, very fine. So what you're seeing a photo of here is a fine root, and a fine root is uh, usually less than a sixth of an sixteenth of an inch in diameter. So they're they're pretty small, and then the root hairs are part of a cell, so very very small. Then the water can enter through. It can go in between the cells. But then it gets stopped. You can see the blue line there. The water can go through between the cells, but it can't get through the endodermis. So there's a layer there in the roots that restricts the movement of water and solutes. That means that all the water and solutes has to go through the membrane of the root before it gets to the xylem. And so that means the membrane can actually control how much water is going into the roots. And the same with solutes. So the water is going in through these proteins that are called aquaporins, the water channel proteins. And they can open and close. So the tree can actually regulate how much water is going in by opening and closing these water channels. But it also means that it takes some energy. So if there's no energy, the tree can't take up water, it can't open and close those channels. And if the root dies, there's no membrane and then the water just flows freely into the roots and the solutes and any contaminants do as well. So that's, you know, in a nutshell, how water gets into the roots. Then it moves up the stem through the xylem. So that's towards the center of the tree and we would call that wood an immature tree. So it's always moving through the center. And it always moves up. And it can move in different patterns. And there have been some really interesting studies looking at the pattern of water movement. Um, so in some species, that water will move from one root and go right up to one stem, you know, one set of leaves. In other species, the water kind of spreads out as it moves up the tree. Some species, it circles as it goes up and redistributes. So the pattern of water movement really depends on the species of tree. And so for some species, if you see a section of the tree canopy that's dead, it might mean that that section of root system is dead, but not necessarily on the same side of the tree. Hmm. So once it gets to the top, it's going out through the veins, from through larger veins into the smaller veins and out to the mesophyll cells where it's used. And looking at the, the movement of water, it goes you know, through that midrib and then out into these mesophyll cells and looking at a stained section of it, the water moves through the cells and the cell walls as liquid water. And then within the mesophyll, within the leaf itself, it turns into a water vapor in some areas and it can exit through the stomata. So when the stomata are open, the tree is losing water through those open stomata. So there's another reason that the, the tree has to control the opening of the stomata. Of course, if it closes them, it's not getting any CO2. So if it's really dry, 
there's not enough water available, it doesn't want to lose water, it'll close the stomata, but then it also closes off its source of CO2. Okay, so now we have CO2 going into the leaf, into the mesophyll, and we've got water going through the root and up the stem and into the, the leaf and the mesophyll. And you all know that when you add sunlight, we get photosynthesis. And let's talk a little bit more about light because light is so important for the tree. And it's not just light. I'm gonna divide light up into three different properties to talk about it. The quantity, the quality, and the duration, because they all have very different effects, and different influences on the tree. So when we look at the quantity, really thinking of the brightness or the intensity. Is it bright sunlight? Is it the shade? Um, and the units that we use are uh, photon flux density, PPFD, and also if it's you know, brighter for a longer amount of time, the tree overall gets more sunlight. So this mainly influences photosynthesis. And here's a graph that shows the rate of photosynthesis with the level of light across the bottom. And so as the light increases, the rate of photosynthesis increases. And there's a maximum. So it gets up to a certain brightness, but beyond that, the tree can't use more sunlight and the extra sunlight can actually hurt the tree. It causes some stress. Different species are really different in that level of light that they can use. Some of them can use a lot more light, others um, kind of max out at fairly low light levels. And those would be those shade tolerant species. It also depends on where the tree is grown. And so if the leaves develop in full sunlight, they're usually able to use more sunlight where leaves that develop in the shade are better at surviving in the shade, they use less light. So that's quantity. So it's influencing photosynthesis. Now think about the spectrum for a minute. So if we look at, here's a painting from Monet, Bodmer Oak. And some of the light coming through the canopy is absorbed by the leaves because the leaves are using it for photosynthesis. So they're absorbing wavelengths in the blue and in the red. And what's coming through the canopy is enriched in kind of oranges and yellows. And artists know this, and you can see the, the understory here really showing up in the oranges because the quality of light is influenced by that canopy. And it's not quite that simple. Um, looking at some different types of, of canopies and shade. Um, here's a study that found there was more you know, purple light in that early successional areas. It was different from small gaps that were enriched in reds. And then forest shade was a little bit different from woodland shade, but they were both enriched more in blues. So if you have more red light, the cell walls get stiff and the tree grows shorter. That stem doesn't extend very much. If you have very little red light, like in the forest shade, you have lots more blue light and that the apo, this is the apomeric stem. So the very top growing point of the tree, that'll stretch and elongate more. And you might've seen trees planted in these blue tubes. This is a, a tree shelter uh, that simulates being underneath a canopy. And those seedlings will tend to stretch tall in that, those conditions. So the other main effect of the the spectrum of light is phototropism. So that makes the plant grow towards the light. And you can see that in this um, 
photo of a tree hanging over the water. Of course, the water is reflecting blue light. And blue light is the main part of the spectrum that has an effect on um, this plant bending through a hormone called auxins. The other characteristic of the spectrum is how it changes throughout the day. And so here again are a couple of paintings. You know, artists recognize this difference in light quality or light spectrum with more blues in the morning and more oranges and red in the evening. And the tree uses this, it senses, it has several different sensors in the leaves to know what time of day it is. So before, as the sun is just coming up in the morning, you've got lots of blue light. The tree is doing all sorts of internal things that prepare it for photosynthesis. It opens the stomata, it moves the chloroplast up to the top of the leaf, you know, top of the cell. Um, so it prepares for morning. And then again in the evening, it helps it prepare to shut down for the evening. So that's the spectrum. The third kind of factor of light is the light duration. So this is how long that day is. Long days in the summer, we're almost at the longest day now. It tells the tree it's you know, full summer. But as the trees start to get shorter, the tree has to get ready for dormancy. And so this length of the day regulates trees that go uh, going into dormancy and then coming out of dormancy. So it tells the tree what season it is, and then it can adjust accordingly. Okay, so back to our, our tree, we've got water uptake and CO2 and light all accounted for. And it's making sugars. So those mesophyll cells making sugars, what are they going, where are they gonna go? And what's the tree using them for? So I've got um, four different areas, four different things that those, those sugars will go to. They might stay right in the leaves and be used for growth. So new leaves. In some species that growth occurs continuously throughout the growing season. In other species, the growth goes into, the, into buds. And so they're actually developing new leaves inside those buds. So these are all seasonal processes that are regulated by Photoperiod, as I just mentioned. Okay, so the length of the day. Developing flower buds. Again, that's regulated by the length of the day in most species. Uh, and other parts of growth, so it could be leaves, leaf buds. Of course, there's the, the diameter growth. Um, so the growth of the stem. New roots. In order to take up water, remember I mentioned that fine roots are the ones that are taking up water um, primarily. So they've got a lifespan, depending on the species, of about six years. That means the trees always has to produce new roots in order to have efficient water uptake. The same with leaves. Um, it might be producing leaves continuously, might be producing them only at the beginning of the year, or it might be an evergreen that keeps its leaves for several years, but it does need to continue to produce new leaves because leaves have a maximum efficiency at you know, several months of age and then they decline in efficiency. So growth is one of the main places that, um, that this carbon has to go. So some of it is staying up in the leaves, being used for processes in the shoot, but a lot of the carbon goes down through the phloem to the root system. And we sometimes call this the inner bark. So if you look at the inside of the stem, there's the water going up, that's through the center. And then the sugars are going down just below the bark. 
That's why you get some um, insects and sap suckers and um, animals that like to eat that inner bark. It's full of sugars. So the second thing that carbon is used for is respiration. And almost half of the carbon that's actually fixed, so that's taken by the leaves and photosynthesis and turned into sugars, about half of it ends up being used for respiration. And that's the opposite of photosynthesis. It's using sugars um, and oxygen, and it produces CO2. And so all tissues are respiring all the time. Roots aren't photosynthesizing, they're only respiring. So they're giving off CO2 all the time. And if you think of a, a tree, like a deciduous tree, half of the year, it doesn't have any leaves. And so it has no source of sugars. It's relying on its stored energy to do all the respiration for the, the whole tree. So trees breathe, respiration, just like we do. It has to take in oxygen and it lets out CO2. So this is a study you know, looking at how long that process takes. So once sugar goes into the, the roots or into the leaves, how long does it take before the roots use it you know, to get down there and to use it? So this is a study done uh, by Oak Ridge National Lab, just around the corner, one of my colleagues. And they took these big plastic tents and put them over individual trees. Then they were able to put a radio label carbon into the air around the tree. The, the trees took that up, converted it in, into sugars, which were transported to the roots. And they looked at how much of this radio label carbon was in the roots at different times. And so the top graph shows that increasing over, well, it really starts to increase after about day two. So day, it takes about three days for the, uh, the sugars to, to get to the roots and start being incorporated into the roots. It's a little bit faster. So within the first day, you start to see it coming out of the roots in respiration. So that's the sugars going down to the roots and then the soil efflux means the roots are respiring, they're giving off CO2 and that radio-labeled um, carbon is being released. So that happens pretty quickly. And that'll continue for a couple of weeks. But if it's not used immediately, carbon goes into storage. So we can look at the different forms of carbon or types of carbon. Sugar is what's produced you know, as a product of photosynthesis, and it's a really small molecule. So it can be transported pretty easily in the flow. So this is transported all over the plant for wherever it's needed. Starch is a really large molecule. And it can't be transported, but it's really just a bunch of sugar stuck together. So it's a great storage molecule because it's very easy for the plant to take it apart and then send those sugars wherever they're needed. So you'll find starch being used, um, accumulating in some storage areas like the roots. And these are a couple of images showing the um, starch stored in stems of a couple of different species. Yellow poplar at the top and oak at the bottom. And that dark, those dark areas are the starch storage. So you see they're stored in different amounts and also in different locations, which is kind of interesting. So overall, the, the, there's a seasonal pattern to that carb, carbon storage. So in the, the winter, um, the last of the, whatever carbon's left is pretty well sent back up to the shoots. This is for a deciduous tree. And in number two, 
the leaves, new leaves come on. So all the carbon that was in the roots gets sent up to the shoots to make the new leaves. The leaves develop. And then in number three, right in the center there, carbon starting to accumulate again. So we have enough carbon for respiration and the leaves are producing enough to start sending it down to the roots and filling the roots up. So the black indicates that the, the carbon stores are pretty full. So you can see that the roots are full. Then by the end of the summer, the roots are full, the trunk is full, the branches are full, everything's full of carbon. Okay, so maximum carbon storage. And then leaves drop and over the winter, it lives off of those uh, stored carbon, mainly in the roots for respiration and repeats the process again. So there's a, a seasonal pattern. And that's also influenced by that day length. The tree uses the length of the day to sense what time of year it is and whether it should store carbon or use it for growth or other processes. So the last place that the tree is going to use carbon is what I'm going to call fixing stuff. This is a really broad category. And there's always something going wrong. You know, if you're a homeowner, you know what it's like trying to keep your house going, right? You've got, there's always something breaking. Okay, so we've got to fix things that aren't working. Um, you've got to maintain it. So maintenance are things like DNA. DNA is in all cells and it kind of slowly breaks down over time. Things like oxidative stress um, can damage DNA. And so plants always using uh, its resources to fix those things. Some of the cells stop functioning. It needs to either repair those or um, make new cells. And it also makes a whole variety of secondary metabolites. So some of these are for UV protection, ultraviolet light causes that DNA damage um, and it produces some metabolites that can store nitrogen and store other nutrients. And I really didn't get into nutrients, but a lot of, um, or some of that, the, the carbon, the energy in the plant is used to maintain and uptake different nutrients. And it does need those for growth at certain times of the year. So UV protection, um, things like regulating water uptake. There are different molecules that it can make to help it maintain, to help it take up water as the soil is starting to dry. And so under drought conditions, it needs to make more of those, those molecules. Then we've got a whole range of um, damaging influences like herbivores. We've got um, insects, we've got microbes, so viruses. So in terms of um, the herbivores, those secondary metabolites are used to often to deter them um, so that they, they can make these bitter compounds, the phenolics, sometimes toxic compounds. And sometimes it makes um, things that will attract insects that will prey on the herbivores. So this is a whole area of study that's really interesting. It's all these secondary compounds that the tree uses. Interestingly enough, it can also sense a lot of those secondary compounds that are being made by other trees. And so if a tree nearby is under stress, under attack from herbivores, it's giving off these, some of these compounds into the air. The nearby trees sense it and think, oh, 
you know, we've got to start producing some kind of a, a repellent deterrent. There's some evidence that trees that are exposed to smoke will begin to develop thicker bark. That will protect them uh, if there's a fire. So they are making all of these defensive compounds. Um, they're, if there are pathogens, the tree has to wall off those pathogens. So it does have a type of immune system of sorts. So it's putting some energy into repelling those, those microorganisms and walling them off or killing them. Um, then we've got the issue of competing plants. So it makes some, some compounds that can inhibit the growth of, you know, of competing plants. It's called allelopathy. It can inhib inhibit the germination of other plants. And so there's a lot going on there, both in the root system and in the leaves. And then of course, some of those are for attracting um, certain insects, so pollinators. You've got you know, animals that are dispersing seeds. You've got uh, mycorrhizae. And there is evidence that roots will produce some, some specific compounds that attract those mycorrhizae and help them form connections that then helps them take up more water and nutrients. So all of these, you know, this is a really huge category, fixing stuff. Um, so it's fixing things that are you know, damaged by stress, but also trying to prevent stress in a lot of ways. So if you think of this use of carbon, the more carbon is used for this fourth category, for fixing stuff and for repelling um, insects and trying to combat herbivores and pathogens, the less carbon we have for all the other things that are going on. So it means the less carbon we have for growth, the less carbon is stored. If a tree runs out of stored carbon, that's when it dies. Right, so trees don't just die. Look at, at stored carbon for a minute. As long as one cell is alive, they can produce a whole new tree from that, from that cell. Um, if there's carbon still on the roots, they can often make a new shoot. But slowly running out of carbon because they had too many other pressures on them. From, you know, from stress and from herbivores. They run out of carbon and that's their eventual demise. So our four places that carbon go, again, growth, we've got storage, um, we've got fixing stuff and we've got respiration. Okay, so I've, kind of wrapped up um, some of those basics. So I talked about light and we had those different qualities. We had the quantity of light that's influencing how much photosynthesis there is. So that influences how much sugar there is in total, right? So lots of light, lots of sugar. Then we had the um, quality of light that's the spectrum. And so that's making the plant either stretch towards the light or lean towards the light. And we had the duration of light or the photo period that's telling the tree what time of year it is. So it tells it what time of year to store uh, carbon, what time of year to use it for growth. We talked about CO2 uptake, the the different places sugars go, and I talked briefly about water uptake as well. So one thing I really didn't talk about was nutrients. Um, that's a big topic. Nutrients are really not needed for the function of the tree as long as it doesn't have to repair anything, uh, but they are needed when new cells are produced. So. 
it's they're very seasonal in nutrient uptake. But again, that's a whole really another topic. Um, the uptake by roots and the incorporation into growth and into the tree. So with that, I guess I will open it up for questions. Okay, and I've actually written down, well, I've typed down a few questions that have been asked. Um, the first one is, are there different cycles of inspiration and expiration through the stomata or does this happen simultaneously? Also, can you mention gas exchange through um, lenticels? Yes. So stomata, if stomata are open, then CO2 goes in or out um, and oxygen goes in or out. You know, it really, it can't regulate what's moving through them. So if stomata are open and the tree is photosynthesizing, it's taking up CO2, that brings CO2 in through those stomata. They do have a cycle of opening and closing based on the time of day. So in the morning they open because there's blue light, it knows it's morning. But in the afternoon, the stomata will often close because water becomes limiting in the middle of the day. Um, so there's that kind of a daily cycle of you know, stomatal opening and closing. At night, of course, the leaves aren't photosynthesizing, but they are respiring. And so they're letting oxygen out through the stomata. So you do get different, different gas exchange at different times of day. Gas exchange through lenticels is a wonderful topic. And some species use you know, gas exchange through their stems as a really a prime or a very important source of gas exchange. Um, so on all stems that are green, so young stems, the reason they're green is because they're photosynthesizing, they have chlorophyll. That means that they need a way to get CO2 in to photosynthesize. And that's where the lenticels come in. They're just little ruptures that allow CO2 to diffuse into that um, photosynthetic tissue that's in the stem. So green stems are very important. And even some larger stems, especially in some species like aspen and sycamore, um, the, the bark is almost transparent. And so if you scrape off the bark, you'll see a little bit of green underneath. So even some of those large stems have green area, green cortex that's photosynthesizing. And that can be really important in, in drought. Uh, the tree can drop its leaves and use those stems for photosynthesis or in areas that have very short growing seasons. So yes, great question. Okay, the next one. Is there variability between species and what color wavelengths are better absorbed? For example, do variegated trees absorb different types of light than their non-variegated counterparts? Hmm. Yes. And you know, if you ask me if there's a difference between trees for anything, the answer is yes. Um, the basic function of all trees is the same, and that's what I tried to cover, but yeah, some some species are better at almost anything, any part of this than others are. In terms of light, some of them have a little bit different pigments. There's chlorophyll A and B, and they're also carotenoids. Um, and those, those pigments, those main pigments that absorb light can be greater in some species than others, um, you know, just genetically, but they can also vary depending on the light environment that the leaf develops in. There are some leaves that reflect some spectrum, parts of the spectrum because of the waxes on the cuticle. 
And so that also influences their, their light uptake. Yeah, the, the leaves that are on the top of the tree and the ones that are facing south often have more chlorophyll. They have more chloroplasts and more chlorophyll and that allows them to take up more, um, more sunlight at high light levels. Okay, the next question, what effect will climate change have on tree physiology? Uh, well, that's a big one. Um, I mean, there are a lot of effects. You know, there's the temperature effect on everything. All these chemical processes, photosynthesis, uh, respiration, these are all chemical processes and they're affected, their rate is affected by temperature. And so we can expect to see some differences there. Uh, there are a lot of interactions with you know, microbes that are also affected by temperature. One of the big differences that I'm kind of considering and looking at in, in trees is their phenology or their length of their growing period. And a lot of species use the length of the day. That's pretty steady signal. You know, that's not going to change with climate change. And they'll, so they'll use the length of the day to enter dormancy or and or to leave dormancy. Some species use temperature. And for a lot of species, it's not clear cut. They'll use both temperature and photo period both to enter dormancy and to leave dormancy. And so the timing of the spring flush can be greatly influenced by the temperature in a lot of species. Um, in some, I saw something just very recently that, oh, it was the peaches in Georgia. They had a really warm winter. And so that affected the phenology. That means that the Trees came out of dormancy really early. The leaves grew, you know, the flowers bloomed, and then guess what happened? It was earlier than normal and it froze. And so most of the peach crop was lost because of that, that freeze. So that's really the biggest influence that I'm expecting is that um, how it's gonna affect the phenology and those timing of seasonal processes. Um, the next question, what are the first signs of the imbalance between water uptake and sugar production? The stomata close. Um, so water, you know, trees need to maintain water uptake in order to photosynthesize. But if it starts to dry out, the roots have a way of sensing that the water, that the soil is drying. And they actually send a chemical signal up to the leaves that tell us the amount of the clothes. So there's that, that chemical signal, um, the stomata close pretty quickly. And you just get, you can measure photosynthesis, you can measure stomatal opening, and they both just kind of shut down as water becomes less and less available. Um, some species are able to adjust a little bit. You know, there are different things they can do. They can produce some, some of those secondary compounds that allow them to take up water from a drying soil. But that's the first, and it's really not very visible, unfortunately. So we really can't see visible signs, early signs of water stress. Um, the next question, does phototropism, phototropism, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that, in the tree mean that a lot of energy is used, i.e. rate of photosynthesis is increased? Could you repeat that, that last part? Um, the example they gave is, does the rate of photosynthesis increase if photo tropism in the tree um it or does it mean let me just okay. read the question <laughs> yeah I see what you mean yeah uh okay so phototropism is the tree leaning towards blue light 
And so the amount of blue light doesn't affect the amount of photosynthesis. It really, it's a kind of a separate phenomenon. The blue light phototropism makes a tree either stretch tall or stay short um, or lean one way or the other. But the end result is that it's trying to get to the light. And so if that lean makes the tree you know, lean into the light so that it actually intercepts more light, or it's able to grow taller up above the canopy and intercept more light that way, then it's getting more light quantity. And that's what affects the photosynthesis, um, which ultimately affects its growth. This next question, um, how important is humidity? We see many stressed trees in dry weather while they are sitting in or close to regularly irrigated turf or planters. Humidity is the main factor that makes the stomata close. So even if the water, even if the soil is moist, you know, it's irrigated, that's the primary signal for most species. Um, so water might be available, but if there's a big difference between the, the water vapor in the air um, and in the leaf, it will close dry air, basically. The stomata close and it stops photosynthesizing. So irrigation can overcome that somewhat. Um, some species adapt to that or adjust to that much more quickly than others. It's kind of interesting. You'll see some, some species that are very, very responsive to you, know, you irrigate and they'll open up their stomata again really quickly. Others are much more slow to do that. Okay, this next question. What proportion of fixing stuff would go into the coated walls one through three? In a white oak versus yellow poplar, how significant is this investment? Yeah, great question. That's um, okay. So we sometimes say that trees have a couple of different growth strategies. One being kind of live fast, die young. That's more of a yellow poplar strategy, and. The other is a very conservative, um, grow slow, live long strategy. And so species like yellow poplar that have a less conservative strategy, they also, they put less energy into their leaves. So the leaves um, don't make as, take as much energy to make. Oak leaves take a lot of energy to make because they're, they're very, they have a lot of waxes and they have a lot of lignans, so things that repel insects. Um, also a lot of tannins, so a lot of secondary compounds and structure to repel insects. So their strategy is to you know, put more, it, more into that the growth and the secondary compounds and take less damage. Where a yellow poplar, puts less effort or less of its resources into making those leaves, and then it just drops them and makes new ones if it gets attacked, right? So um, they're more expendable. The oak has a really large root for storage, and so it's storing a lot of carbon below ground, and it does that at a very young age. So it's very tolerant of having uh, really anything attack it because it's got stored carbon to fall back on. Yellow poplar doesn't tend to, uh, to store as much, but particularly at those young ages. So yeah, there are two different, really different life strategies in the way that they expend carbon versus um, use carbon to, to maintain and to produce secondary compounds to repel insects and to, to avoid stress. Um, 
with winter trending to longer, warmer periods of growth, do you think that thermotropism has a stronger influence than phototropism? Um, that's, that's an interesting question that I hadn't thought of very much. I mean, I think of that more, you know, thermotropism, we're growing towards warmer areas, and you get that in roots a lot because the growth rate's determined by temperature. So they'll grow towards, sometimes towards areas that are warmer. Um, and how much of that sunlight is heat and is causing them to, to grow towards that heat? I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. Can't answer that off the top of my head. I'm going to have to investigate that a little more. <laughs> okay. Um... The next question, how can we find out which species have the type of roots that direct water only to specific limbs? There have been a limited number of studies. So the studies that were done took a dye and injected a dye into the trunk and then cut the tree down and looked at the area that was stained. Um, I did put a couple of references in the, in the presentation, there are those, I, those few, but there, I don't think there are any real comprehensive studies of different species. It would be interesting though. Okay, um, we still have a few more questions. So in the interest of time, I guess I just wanna make sure that Jennifer, you have enough time to answer. We have about seven more questions. Oh, sure, fine. Okay. So the next one um, is the amount of sugars that move down the um, phloem into the roots driven by other tasks, such as borm formation that the trees are dealing with. Yes. Um, so the, the movement of sugar in the phloem is based on what we call sources and sinks. So there are sources of sugars, and during the growing season, the leaves are photosynthesizing, the leaves are the main source. Where the sugar actually goes is driven by what's called sinks. So that's what, what's using sugar. And those are parts of the plant that are, they're actually pulling those sugars out of the phloem. It's an active process. They say, I need sugars, and they're pulling it out of the phloem, and that makes more sugar flow towards that area. So if there are fruit growing on a tree, that's a big requirement for sugars, and that will pull a lot of the sugars uh, that are being produced by the leaves will be pulled into the fruit during that you know, period of fruit development. So absolutely what's happening in the tree, you know, where those sugars are needed is where they go. And you, know, you can see that with thinning. If you thin some, take half of the fruit off of the tree, the others become larger because there's more sugars uh, to flow into them. So yeah, so buds can be a big sink, um, new, you know, new developing leaves or new developing shoots, uh, roots. If there's been some damage to the roots, they'll need more sugars and they'll pull those. Okay. Um, can you elaborate further on the need of nutrients for trees? That's a whole talk in itself, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, nutrient uptake and use and how it's related to growth is a great topic. I. I hesitate to even try to summarize it in a couple of minutes, um, except to say that nutrients are needed to produce all of those cells. Um, so all the components of the cells. So whenever there's growth, it needs no nutrients. 
So it really is tied to growth, um, the nutrient uptake. Do the stoma close during high temperatures? And if so, how does that affect the health of the tree with hotter summers? So the stomata are, are tied, you know, said mainly to relative humidity that somebody mentioned earlier. The humidity has the greatest influence on the opening and closing. And it, it, I guess it depends on what climate you're in. If you're in more of a dry climate, then the heat is tied to the humidity as well. You know, as you get um, towards the middle of the day, it gets hotter and your humidity goes down. And so in that case, hotter days, stomata close. In tropical climates, a little bit different. It tends to be a high humidity throughout the day and the stomata might not close. But the water that's released through the stomata has a cooling effect too. And so the trees can use that to help cool the leaves in hot weather. So a drought in hot weather, the tree has to keep its stomata closed and it can't benefit from that cooling effect of water being lost from the leaves. So it could be more detrimental to the tree. Um, for pruning and trimming operations, the recommendation used to be not to remove more than 25% of foliage or crown in order to maintain adequate photosynthesis and tree health. Is that still a reasonable rule of thumb? That's probably a good rule. Let's say this is really going to be species specific. Some species just come back so quickly. You know, you can cut the whole top of the tree down and they just come right back. They don't care. Other species are, are a lot fussier. Um, they don't have as more, much stored carbon to, to recover from that. The other issue I think is that when you trim a tree, you've got a lot of kind of openings in the wood that allows pests and pathogens to get in. Um, the tree is releasing these stress hormones that's saying, I'm damaged, I'm damaged, and that calls insects. Um, so it's going to be using a lot of its resources to try to mend those areas that have been cut. And it doesn't have a, as many resources to use for other things. So, you know, limiting the amount of damage, I'd say, is really a good rule at any given time is a good rule. Also, if you've got a really great growing season, the trees aren't stressed at all, you can take off more. Right, but if you've got a really stressful year, try to minimize the amount that you take off. But I, I'd say the rule of thumb is probably still good. Okay, these next couple of questions are kind of lengthy. Um, According to Dr. Patrick Moore with the University of British Columbia, the earth is now experiencing a carbon drought he cites data derived from Antarctic ice core analysis that indicates much higher atmospheric CO2 concentration during the past 100,000 years than in recent centuries. How will the current increase in atmospheric CO2 concentration affect the world's forest, species distribution, tree health, and other sylvic qualities? Really good question. Um, so Oak Ridge National Lab has done some studies on this. Um, at first, they found the early response is that trees, if there's a higher concentration of CO2, they produce more sugars and they can grow faster. Uh, they can take in more CO2 with stomata that are partially closed. And so you know, more CO2 tended to result in greater growth. Over longer periods of time, um, as they continued the study, 
they found that you know, they were enriching the air around a whole stand of trees with CO2. And over time, they found that growth became limited by other things. So while initially growth was greater, um, eventually the low nitrogen became the limiting factor. And so there were still some effects of elevated CO2, but not so much in the tree growth. There are some effects still on roots, but they have some great work that's been done on that. Okay, just a few more here. Um, this is a follow-up to um, the question about humidity earlier. Mm -hmm. um, they're asking if, is humidity a greater determinant of stomata closure than temperature? This person says they're in the South where temperatures are over 90 degrees daily and trees seem to do just fine and stripping of the Stripping the interior of southern live oak is very common. Is losing interior growth less of a concern in humid areas? And does high humidity mean that shade leaves are less critical? Hmm. Shade leaves, well, okay. So shade leaves tend to, they have a little bit different structure. Um, they don't do the majority of the photosynthesis. And so I'd say I'm really under any conditions, taking off those shade leaves is going to be less of a problem for the tree. You know, the tree, when the carbon balance of those leaves becomes negative, that means that the leaf is using more carbon than it's actually producing. So if it's in really deep shade, it just kills the leaf off. And a lot of those shade leaves are, you know, close to that carbon balance anyway. So I think taking off this, the shade toward, leaves toward the center of the tree wouldn't have a great effect. Um, in the steep south, you've got high temperatures, but you generally have high humidity too in the middle of the day. And so compared to somewhere that gets hot and dry, and that humidity is the result of trees transpiring. And so, you know, I lived in Mississippi for a while. I know how hot and humid it is, and it's the water being released from the, the leaves that keeps that humidity in the air. Um, so the humidity response, I think, they would tend not to close their stomata because the air is more humid, but also your trees that are growing in that area are ones that are both adapted. So they're species that grow best under those, you know, those hot conditions, um, but they're also acclimated. So they've grown up and they've developed their structure under those conditions. So those, you know, the temperatures of 90 plus are typical for that area and the trees really wouldn't have any problem with it. Okay. Um, is there any link between closing of the stoma and sudden limb drop? Oh, um, I don't know. And from what I understand, there's the cause of sudden limb drop has not been identified. My guess, uh, hypothesis, is that as during the day, if there's, um, if it's a really dry day, trees will lose more water through the stomata than they're able to take up. And so the wood actually shrinks. And at night, it swells again. And so the whole stem, all the wood is shrinking and swelling daily. And if you get a prolonged drought, it can shrink quite a bit. So I think that that's partly related to stomatal closure because if the stomata close, the wood shrinks less, the tree is losing less water. Um, 
But my guess would be that shrink swell cycle is might have something to do with sudden limb drop, but I don't know. Be a great study. And does the inner canopy help the tree maintain its canopy temperature? Yeah, it, yeah, because the leaves are shaded, um, and so it's releasing water vapor that has a cooling effect. So yeah, definitely it could lower the temperature of the, the atmosphere within the tree. Yeah. And last question. Can you share a link to the image attributed to Larcher 2001? The picture is with five tree silhouettes and where carbon is ostensibly stored seasonally. I don't have a link offhand, but that's um, yeah. I don't have one handy. Um, I could always also post it whenever I post yeah. the recording online. Yeah, I'll, I'll add that uh, a link to that part in the PowerPoint. All right. Well, those are all the questions I have. Um, Thank you all for the fantastic questions. As I say, every every tree is different, and physiology is such a huge topic that you know, I try to do a little bit of everything. But I, you know, try to keep up with everything, but it's not always possible. So if, if anybody has some great information please feel free to send it to me. I'm always interested in reading new, new material on you know, trees' response to the environment. And I'll also enter your information in the recording that I post. That way, if people do have questions, they can just reach great. out to you. Um, Neil, I know we're cutting it close on time. Do you need to go right now, or do you want me to wrap uh, it up? I, I, uh, just uh, real quickly, I wanted to say to Jennifer, uh, thank you for an outstanding presentation. I've been looking at the comments and re responses, and I think you uh, hit a home run uh, with your material. And I, I know personally, uh, I learned a lot, and uh, uh, just I really appreciate the time you spent in this and the job you, the excellent job you did. Well, you're very welcome. I, I'm glad that some folks got some useful information out of it. Yes. Uh, it's a learned group, believe me, and it goes both ways. <laughs> uh, I will kind of put you on the spot. You mentioned that there is a need for a full time slot to talk about plant and uh, nutrients. Uh, and uh, I, were you volunteering to give <laughs> a presentation <laughs> maybe next year as we line up our top? I'm just going to leave it with you. I don't want to uh, but uh, you you did such a great job. We would definitely be interested in having you come back and talk well, on a topic you. like that or anything of your choosing. Yeah, that's a great topic and one that I'm really interested in, you know, how nutrient uptake ties to growth. So I'd be happy to come back if there's a demand for that information. Okay, well, Katie, you heard her, so uh, we'll definitely <laughs> I did. Work, work that out. Uh, let's just go to the last two slides, Katie. We have just some follow-up information and, uh, and uh, some info on next month's presentation. Uh, yes, pull that up. I'll give yeah. Katie a second. Uh, we've had some great speakers, Katie and uh, Jennifer definitely uh, fit the bill there. Oh, there we go. Um, okay, here, yeah. Uh, next month's we, uh, webinar is going to feature Dr. Kathleen Wolf. I learned in, when we lined this up, she is now retired from the University of Washington, but she is well known in the urban forestry community for her groundbreaking research in human sociology and urban landscapes. And she has agreed to give a talk uh, next month, uh, Thursday, July 20th, uh, same time, same place on nature and trees and the Associated Human Health Response. Uh, so we're looking forward to hearing from Kathleen uh, uh, next month. And I think we have one more slide, do we not? Uh, 
for those yes. folks that uh, this is a, a new uh, appeal, but this uh, webinar series is brought to you uh, through a co uh, collaboration between the UT School of Forestry, a School of Natural Resources and the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council. And uh, there are some costs to align with this, but we want to keep this free for our viewers. But if you feel so led, if you'd like to contribute any amount uh, to, uh, to this series of webinars, it will allow us to expand it technically, but also perhaps get in some speakers uh, that would normally we wouldn't be able to uh, to schedule. So there's a uh, QR code there and give you a second to link that if you'd like, and it gives you a way of contributing whatever you uh, would like to towards this series. It'll go into a separate account, not going to be used for anything except to further the quality of, uh, of our webinar presentations. Okay, so with that, thank you all for uh, sitting uh, for attending the webinar today and we look forward to seeing you next month.